so much. Tonight's Get in the Zone class is dedicated by Ariel Miriam Bat Orli. May this year bring us oneness and shalom within ourselves in finding shiduchim, in loving and caring for all. And as well, anonymously, is dedicated in celebration of the upcoming Hagim. May we be zocher to tap into their greatness and in doing so, may Hashem bless the kahal with an abundant year of beracha, health, happiness, and success. Okay. Baruch atah Adonai Elohim Melech Haolam Shehakol Nehiyav Baro. Let's begin. We titled the class um, "How You Like Them Apples." Not everyone will know this uh, this uh, little bit of pop culture, but um, I'm referring, of course, to the to the minhag that we have on the night of Rosh Hashanah to dip our apples in honey. Now, in order to just kind of give you a little bit of a, a background to this, the idea of dipping apples in honey is not mentioned in the Gemara. The Gemara in Kiritut and as well in Horayot says as follows, Amar Abaye, Abaye taught, Hashta de amrit simana milta, now that you're teaching us that simana, that a sign, a symbol, is something that's important, Yeheragil inish lemechal reshata. A person on the, fir- in the beginning of the year, he should be, uh, he should make sure to eat lemechal reshata kera virubia karti silka vitamri. He should have gourd, fenugreek, leeks, beets, and dates. Some of the things that you might recognize from the table on Rosh Hashanah. Ashkenazim usually have far less. They have an apple and honey. They have the head of either a fish or a, what's it called, or a sheep. But Sefaradim have many, many different ones. And in fact, it's brought down in the Shulchan Aruch, all the different ones that the Sefaradim have. And then the Ramah Rabbi Moshe Isil, it says in the Minhag of, of our co- communities, in, uh, in Ashkenaz was to have tapuah, to have an apple dipped uh, bidvash in honey. Of course, because what would halacha be without a machloket? The Ben Yishchai says, you should absolutely not have an apple and honey on Rosh Hashanah. <laughs> you should rather have an apple, he says, cooked in sugar. I don't know, has anyone ever had that before? I think that one didn't catch on as well because, you know, cook the apple in the sugar. It just doesn't... It's not the same, right? So therefore, it's not, that's not a thing. And in fact, many of the poor scheme talk about this idea that according to Kabbalah, maybe it would be better not to have the apple dipped in honey, but rather to have it uh, cooked in sugar ahead of time. In the end of the day, uh, the poor scheme say that it's a fine thing to have, not a problem. If you look, you'll see in many of the Sephardic machzorim, it doesn't say, Shana tova umituka kadevash. It skips out that last line. It does not say that it should be uh, sweet like honey because according to Kabbalah, honey represents deen or judgment and that's not what we're trying to elicit on the high holidays. Now, not having uh, Kabbalistic leanings without entering into the metaphysical realm. And there are many different reasons for these types of things. There's once I saw that someone says, I think it's the Imre Noam, who says that the eating of the apple and the honey on the night of Rosh Hashanah can be a symbol for someone who has not had children, who is struggling with having children, to be able to give birth to kids. And he says, interestingly enough, that tapuach is the numerical value of piru and the word revu, which is the words in the Torah that tells a person to have children. And the word devash, this one's going out to all the ladies out there, the word devash is the numerical value of isha. So a woman, when they say, is a sweet, is maybe sweet like honey, that's the numerical value of devash. I was lucky enough to have that gematria make sense because I married my wife, Hannah, and she actually fulfills that, but I think other people do not necessarily get to meet women that the numerical values uh, is, uh, <laughs> coincides with their lived experience, like we say. Okay, having said all of this, I'd like to take perhaps a much deeper um, look into what it is that's going on here with this dipping of the apples uh, in honey on Rosh Hashanah, but indeed everything that we do on the night of Rosh Hashanah. A little kind of pro tip as well. If you ever look at the table and you see something that you really don't like. So we have, in our custom, we bring out the head of a sheep and we put it on the table. 
If that is the very last thing that you're going to eat on Rosh Hashanah, you should know that you're still allowed to say the prayer that is associated with that thing, even if you don't eat it. In fact, according to some poor scheme, you only put the item on the table, you don't even have to eat it at all. So if there's one of the things that you want the prayer, but you don't want to eat it, you're still able to rely on that opinion uh, in the poor scheme to be able to do so. But I want to ask you what I think is a very powerful question. And that is how we're going to begin our talk tonight, uh, the depth of what we want to learn together tonight. And that is as follows. If it's true that simana milta, that a sign means something, that symbolism is important, so why is it that we don't, uh, I don't know, on the night before we go out on a date, eat a date and say, Hashem should give us a nice date. Right? Why do we do that? How come we don't use this idea that symbolism means something on any other night? How come we don't say on the night of Sukkot, you know what, Hashem, I'm now going to have this warm, uh, you know, uh, what's it called? This warm, uh, uh, you know, cider because you hear at song that we should stay warm on the freezing nights of Sukkot. We don't say that. Why only on Rosh Hashanah are we using this concept? of Sima Na Milta. How come the apple features only here? And I think that this concept, that this question, allows us to look at the story of Rosh Hashanah with very different eyes. And once we understand Rosh Hashanah this way, we recognize that perhaps there's something that we've been missing all these years in celebrating Rosh Hashanah. And if we could tap into it, properly, we'd have a remarkable holiday. Let's begin with this idea. <clears throat> the Gemara tells us a fascinating story. It tells us in Sukkah on page 52a, the following story. Le'atid lavo, in time to come, when Mashiach will be here, listen to this. God brings the Yetzer the evil inclination. He brings Satan, the devil, whatever term you want to use. He brings him at the end of time. And he slaughters the Yetzer he kills the Yetzer In front of the righteous. And in front of the wicked. Tzadikim nidme lahem, the Sadikim look at the Yetzehara that God dragged in and slaughters, and he seems to them, it appears to them to be Har Gavoa, a, a huge mountain. Virishaim, and the wicked look at the Yetzehara that's being slaughtered in front of them, and it seems to them nidme lahem kichut haseara. It seems to them to be. A, 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 like a piece of hair, as thin as one strand of hair. Halalu bochim, says the Gemara. Look at to this dramatic story. The Sadiqim are crying. The Halalu bochim and the Rishayim are crying. Tzadikim bochim ve'omrim, the Tzadikim are crying and they say, He'ach yachonu l'chvosh har gavoa kazeh. How did we manage? How did we manage to overcome this great mountain, the Yetzehara, how difficult all the challenges were, all the Averot were, all the times that you were able to just sleep in in the morning, all the times that you saw something or did something or, or, or took something that you shouldn't have. How were we able to beat, to scale this lofty mountain? Virishaim Bochim, and the wicked cry and they say, how is it that we were unable to defeat this strand of hair, it's so thin, all we needed to do was step right over it. How could it be that we were defeated by this thin strand of hair? This is all in the Gemara on page Sukkah 52. You can go check it up yourself. No exaggerations. No dramatizations, exactly as is. But the Mifarshim, the commentators ask what seems to be a very powerful question. Which one is it? What is the Yetzirah? Is he a strand of hair? Is he nothing? Or is he an insurmountable mountain? And it seems like the Tzadikim are very sure about what they're saying. And it seems like the Rishaim are very sure about what they are saying. 
I heard once a great answer to this Gemara. And the answer that's brought, I forget in whose name, it escapes me now, but the answer that's brought is magnificent. The Sadiqim, they see this Yetzehara, they recognize this Yetzehara from when? From before, from F, from, excuse me, from before the action. You know, a person, when you're about to sin, it, you know, it smells amazing. That non-kosher food, you're not sure if it's kosher, it's, you're just you're salivating. You're so excited. A person, God forbid, who does something that they shouldn't have, right? In the beginning, they have these dreams, these fantasies about what it's going to look like, about what it's going to feel like, what it's going to taste like, how I'll feel. You know, all of advertising and marketing, that's how it works. They tell you if you buy this beer, if you buy this car, if you own this suit, if you just go on vacation here, you know how you're gonna, you know what it's gonna feel like? It's, it, that thing is giant. But when a rasha, after you ate that thing, you went to this restaurant, you ate that food, how do you feel now? After you spent all that money, you have a stomach ache. You ate it, okay, whatever, now it's gone. The enjoyment of that thing is now dissipated. All that's left is a chut ha So what the Gemara is saying is that the tzaddikim, because they didn't sin, they are perpetually, they live in the world of before a sin. They didn't do the sin. So therefore, the only exposure they have to the yetzehara is the yetzehara and his lies. And they see it as giant. But the rishaim, that they capitulated every time, in every single circumstance, doesn't every sin promise to be more than it turns out to be? Every time, you know, you got angry, you lost your temper. Now you feel like two cents. You screamed at this person. Now, after the fact, in the beginning, it feels amazing. You unloaded on this person. You destroyed them. You decimated them. You put them in their place. Now, two seconds later, now the guy's sitting there and you see the guy is crestfallen. He's crying. He's upset. What do you feel like? You feel like a piece of garbage. The Rishaim, who never exercise any self-restraint, which Yetzehara do they know? They know the Yetzehara of regrets. And those regrets are cheap. They are surface level. They're like the thickness of a piece of hair. My friends, once we understand this idea in the Gemara, we start to realize a very powerful thing. It was the altar of Kelm, the sage of Kelm who taught that perhaps the only difference between the righteous of this world, between the tzaddikim of this world, and the wicked of this world, is that the tzaddikim use the power of their imagination for positive imagery. And the power that they have to... Uh, succeed to do well is because they can use their imagination, use their, uh, their mental capacities to be able to imagine, to see, to feel, to give texture to a decision uh, in a way that a, a rasha does not. And let me explain what this looks like. You know, in the first sin where Eve ate from the tree and then gave to her husband, and then her husband Adam also ate from the tree. That's called original sin. One of the great things, the most beautiful ideas that's taught in the name of the pre tzaddik, Rabbi Tzadok HaKohen from Lublin, Rabbi Tzadok taught that if a person wants to truly understand anything in this world, what do they need to do? They go to the first place that that concept appears in the Torah, and there, in that moment, in those descriptions that the Torah gives, you will find the concept, the idea, the nuance, the quantification of that thing. So if you want to know how you build a good relationship, look at the first relationship in the Torah. I'll give you an example. What is the most, perhaps, the most important thing in creating a healthy relationship? You know, in New York City, they say dating is very hard. And those of you who have heard me before will understand and will know that one of the reasons why dating in New York City is hard is because there are so many options. There's so many people. 
The Jewish pool of people. It's not like you go to a small town, there's a couple of guys, a couple of girls, you give everyone their fair shot. Over here, you're thinking, if it's not you, it's the 900 people behind you. So therefore, when they're actually dating, they're only half in. Because they're already thinking, if not this one, the next one. They already are in plan B, while they still haven't given plan A a full chance. Correct? So one of the most important lessons of relationships is to think in the time that you're trying to build a relationship, there is nobody else. A secret to a good marriage is to think that there isn't anybody else. And in fact, that's one of the blessings that we give under the chuppah. We bless the chatan and kala with the joy, and with the joy that God gave you, God gave in Gan Eden. What was that joy? You know what the joy was? That Adam knew that there wasn't another Eve. And Eve knew that there wasn't another Adam. They were exactly with the person that they were supposed to be with. There wasn't anyone else. There was no one better. They had no other options. And that brought a tremendous amount of joy to know that they were with the only person for them in the world. That great secret of relationship is codified in the first relationship you find in the Torah. So when you're looking to understand the essence of a thing, look to its first iteration. And there lies the secrets to understanding it. If we're trying to understand sin, then we have to look at the first sin. And let's look at that first sin together. And I want to read you one sentence, and I'd like someone here to ask me a question. And the woman saw, Eve saw, Chava, that the, food, the tree was good to eat. Question. Sorry? Question number one is it should say the fruit looked good to eat, correct? One of the answers to that is that this was the only tree where the tree and the fruit actually were imbued with the same taste, right? Excellent. How could you see that something's good to eat? She had never experienced this food before. How could she see that it was good to eat? And it, it, was, it was desirous to the eye. And this tree, it was so beautiful in the ability that it had to give you wisdom. And she ate from the fruit and she took from the fruit and she ate. And she gave also to her husband and he ate. Do you know what I find amazing about this pasuk? We have this unbelievable build-up. You ever see pictures of a restaurant where they show you like these ribs, like sitting there in this delicious sauce? And they always, I don't know if you ever noticed this, they always like prop up ribs on the plate. You ever notice that? Like they put stuff underneath it and the ribs are like, hallelujah, right? They're just like hanging ten on top of the item. Or there's a beautiful steak and there's like a beautiful strip of uh, rosemary on top of it. It kind of looks very fresh because, you know, because it, it was what? Was it they hanging out? Was like this was this just stick went to the, you know, get a drink with the steak when they were killed? I don't know exactly. But they dress up this whole plate because presentation is everything. Isn't it? Could you get a better presentation than the Bible just gave this fruit? Vatikach mi pirio. And she plucked this fruit that was delicious and it looked amazing and it made you so smart. And she ate it. What do we know about how the fruit tasted? Nothing. Do we even know which fruit it was? No. Are you hearing me? There's zero description about what it actually was, tasted like, how it affected her. You know, it reminds me of the story of a fellow um, who says uh, that, what's it called? Uh, he, he sells this fish for $1,000. And the man comes and he says, fish for $1,000. I mean, I've heard of sashimi grade tuna, right? But fish for $1,000, he says, oh, this is no ordinary fish. He says, it isn't? 
No, he says, this fish, anyone who eats this fish, it makes you brilliant. All of a sudden you have a, you know, unbelievable understanding of the world. You get to realize and see how people think. You know, you, once you taste this fish, you'll never be the same ever again. The guy says, wow, okay, it's worth it. He puts down $1,000, he buys the fish, he bites into the fish. He says, after chewing the fish, he swallows. He turns to the guy, he says, this is ridiculous. This fish is exactly like everybody else. You just put $1,000 outside. You see, this guy says, you see, it's working. So once I was reading this pasuk and I was like, it's supposed to make you smart. And then I realized, vatiten gam le'isha. She gave some to her husband. Maybe it's working. <laughs> yeah? Our rabbis say that in that moment she thought to herself, could it be that I'll die? Could it be that he'll find another woman? Could it be that he'll love someone else? If I'm going... He's going. Vatiten gam isha ima. That's why it says ima, and he gave, she gave to him ima with her vayochal, and he eats as well. I want you to understand something very powerful here. What we're learning here is that the power of sin lies in its ability to inflame, to excite our imagination. So therefore, the battlefield of sin, of anything wrong, where is it? It's right here. It's in the mind, in the way that we think. And once we realize this, we see this concept coming up all over the place in the Torah. When Yosef is about to do the sin with Potiphera, what happens? He sees he imagines his father's image. It stops him from sinning. We see right above us on the words of the, of the synagogue, Shiviti Hashem Nenegdi Tamid, I place God in front of me always. We see the idea of the power of the imagination to create something that stops us, that holds us in our purity. But this idea that appears again and again and again, don't sit, you don't want to sin, imagine these three things, Ayin Ro'ah, the Mishnah and Avot. This idea that it's telling us something, that if we harnessed it, could do something uh, tremendous in the experiences of our life. And in fact, now we finally understand what the purpose of Rosh Hashanah actually is. And let me explain what I mean by this. The words Rosh Hashanah literally means the head of the year. My father asked the question on Shabbat and he, exp he expressed it this way. Rosh means the head of something. If you mean that it's the beginning of the year, it should have said, Tchilat Hashana, which means the beginning of the year. What does it mean, the head of the year? The head, of, what does that mean? What the head? And the answer is that this head of the year, Rosh Hashana, is not only the head of a year, the word Shana also means Shinui, to change. Rosh Hashana, therefore, accurately translated can mean a head of change. Most of us think that these experiences that we have in our life are negative character traits. We are a victim of our character traits. You hear this all the time. Oh, I can't. You know, she made me angry. What do you mean she made you angry? What are you, Play-Doh? You got angry. She did something that made you decide to get angry, but you decided to get angry. To say she made me angry is to say that I am a robot, I am a puppet to be controlled by another. Rosh Hashanah says, you can control your anger. Oh, what should I do? I'm just a negative person. No, you're choosing to be a negative, cynical person. You don't have to be that. Rosh Hashanah means you can have a head of change. But where do we change from? We change from this place, from our thoughts, from our imagination, from our visualizations. Now, if you think that this is a new age concept, you'll see, like I said, that it appears again and again and again and again in the Torah, three and a half thousand years ago. We're talking about this concept, but I want to show you how this Rosh Hashanah goes even further. 
You see, there's a machloket, a disagreement in the Talmud as to what day Rosh Hashanah actually took place on. When did God create the world? The Gemara says, Rabbi Eliezer Omer B'Tishrei. Rabbi Eliezer says on the first of Tishrei, Rosh Hashanah. Rabbi Yoshua Omer, Rabbi Yoshua teaches, B'Nisan, the first of Nisan, Nivra Olam. Okay, now listen to this and listen carefully. Now that means, let's get this clear, that means, that if he holds it was on Tishrei, he holds on Nisan, how could they both be right? They can't be. So it seems like one of them's right and one of them's wrong, correct? In fact, Tosafot on page 27a, quoting Rabbeinu Tam, shares a remarkable idea. He says that they are arguing, but that they are not necessarily uh, saying different things. And if you don't know what that means, Think of the last argument that you had where the person's yelling and you're, you're like, no, I don't think we're arguing. I'm saying the same thing. You're just saying and I'm just saying, right? You understand? It's a different perspective. Tosafot says, and I'm going to quote the words of Rabbeinu Tam. Both of these are the word of the living God. And one could understand. In Tishrei, God thought of creating the world. Right? It wasn't built until... Nisan. So God built the world in Nisan. God thought of building the world in Tishrei. Now, I don't know if any of you ever noticed this, by the way, because it's a fascinating thing. When is Rosh Hashanah, everyone? You ask every Jewish kid, what month is Rosh Hashanah? Tishrei. That's how we hold, right? Slight problem. Look in the Torah. And you know when it tells you, you know what it calls the day that we celebrate Rosh Hashanah? Be'echad. Lachodesh Hashivi'i on the first day of the of the seventh month. Are you not seeing an accounting problem here? <laughs> How could that be the beginning of the world if that's the seventh month? That means that we counted six months on the calendar before a world even existed. My friends, I'm sharing with you something that I think is so beautiful. What we are saying here is. The creation of the world did not happen when the world was built. It happened when God thought, let me create a world. And I don't know why you think, you may think to me, you're to yourself, I don't care, why is this relevant to me? Because we say on Rosh Hashanah, Hayom Harat Olam, this is the day that you created the world. We say, This is the first day of your creation. My friends, a thought is a creative process. When you decide, when you're forgiving someone, when someone has broken your heart and you decide to let that go, you think that happens on the day that you say, I forgive you? No. That's the day you finish forgiving them. When did you first begin to forgive? It was that first thought that you had. Maybe he didn't mean to hurt me. Maybe he actually was telling the truth when he said all that time ago, I'm actually not ready to settle down to commit. I have a lot of problems. I'm dealing with things in my life. You translated that as rejection. But maybe he wasn't there. And maybe he couldn't do that. And to give you the answer that you wanted at that stage would have actually been disingenuous, untrue, and potentially harmful. The minute you think to yourself, oh my gosh, I'm seeing this guy in the street. I see he's not together. This was a guy who when I met him the first time, he was all put together. Now look at him. His beard is grown. The guy looks like he's not taking care of himself. His pants are ripped. He looks like a homeless person. He's clearly, he wasn't lying when he told me that. He's going through some stuff. If you could think that, that is the beginning of the process of forgiveness and the shift that happens here. It begins here. Did you ever wonder why on Rosh Hashanah we don't talk about any of our sins? It's the day we're being judged. Why don't we tell Hashem, forgive me? We don't. Not only that, we also don't tell Hashem all the things that we want. Why? 
Everything's hanging in the balance. Could you imagine going to court and, you know, you walk in, the judge says, okay, you have one day, represent yourself. And the guy stands up and he says, no further questions. And he sits down. What, you, what, what did you just do? And the answer is that actually the process of Rosh Hashanah, in truth, it's not about your actions. Although it is, but in truth, it's not about your actions. It's about your head. It's about getting your head straight. If once upon a time, God on Rosh Hashanah said, okay, let me imagine the world that I want to build, then the power of this day, what is the power of this day? It's creating a mental blueprint for what we want our world, our lives, ourselves to look like. It's not about fixing the leaky sink in the basement. It's not low-level thought process. It's super high-level creative process. How do I want to look? How do I want to feel? What kind of person do I want to be? And that's why we talk about this world that's so godly and so beautiful. It's unreal. If this is the case, then we start to actually recognize why on Rosh Hashanah we're paying so much attention to a stinking apple and honey. Simana milta. You know, a sign is a thing. Yeah, but it's a, it's a thing every day. Yeah, but not like today. Because today, when you get a taste in your mouth and something tastes sweet, in fact, some of the uh, Sepharim write that you're supposed to specifically have red apples. Does anyone know this? Not even green apples. Because green apples have a tartness to, this, to them. They're a little bit sour. And on Rosh Hashanah, even if you're going to dunk the thing in honey, who cares? Yes, but there should be zero sour element to the apple that you're eating. In this moment, if I could be in a pristine state, thinking thoughts of joy, of happiness, thinking what I want my life to look like, how I want to be, how I want to present in this coming year, then what I dreamed into existence on Rosh Hashanah can actually become a thing. Let's do a thought exercise. I want to imagine something with you. Can we do that? Okay? I want everyone here to close their eyes for a second and I want you to think for one second that I just plugged your head into a computer and this computer is attached to a giant 3D printer and you could think uh, a question that my daughter asked me last night if someone was to buy me a car any car which car would I choose okay so I want you guys to think of whichever car you'd want your favorite car down to the details the seat can you imagine the leather seat the stitching can you imagine the radio, the dashboard, the wood? I don't know what you like. Is it a hard top? Is it convertible? Is it a Jeep? Is it a cyber truck, right? You probably have issues if it's a cyber truck. But either way, all the different things, could you imagine? And I want you to imagine that after you finish imagining this car, whatever you thought, the computer captured your thoughts and created and printed that car and you'd walk out of the synagogue and there sitting in front of the synagogue would be the car that you thought into existence. Anything you didn't think, it doesn't print. The specificity that you use to imagine your dream car, exactly the color, is the floor carpet or rubber? What does the trunk look like? How fast is the engine? Right? You're imagining, I'm imagining that you're imagining the place where you put your sunglasses, the thing that pops down. And by the way, it's one of those ones that when you push it, it does that like slow drop. Right? I always, I don't know, but from now on you're going to do this whenever you do this. You're going to go into your car, you're going to push the button, and it's going to do the slow drop. And you're going to hear my voice going, ooh, dramatic. Now, I'm a weird person. I talk to things. <laughs> I'll be like, at that thing, I'll be like, oh, you're such a drama queen. <laughs> like making an entrance. Here are your sunglasses. <laughs> Do you understand me, okay? 
the thought that you'd put into each and every piece of the car, down to the clicker. I once saw a very fancy car where the clicker was actually in the shape of the car itself. And if you needed the doors, you clicked on the door itself on the little car. And if you needed the trunk, you clicked on the trunk of the little car. How cool is that, right? You know what the answer is? That's Rosh Hashanah. What are you dreaming into existence? Simana Milta. If I could get you to think about a sweet apple, if I could get you to think about Eloshel Avraham Avinu, that once upon a time, Avraham was so sure, he was so dedicated to God, that there was nothing that he was willing. There was nothing that he would hold back from Hashem. Could you imagine that? Because if you can, then you can be it. Are we starting to sense the power of this day of Rosh Hashanah? Think for one second. What is the name of this day? The holiday is called Yom... Huh? Yom Azikaron. Excellent. In the Torah it's called Yom Teruah and it's called Yom Azikaron. The Talmud says that the reason for that is because sometimes you would have a shofar, the day when you blow the shofar, that's Yom Teruah. But on the days that you don't have the shofar, it's called Yom Hazikaron. So let's think for one second. Which is the more essential, the truer name of the day? Yom Hazikaron or Yom, ha Yom Teruah? Yom Hazikaron. Because it is possible to have Rosh Hashanah without a shofar. And it is not possible to have a shofar without Rosh Hashanah. If that's true, then even the name of the day is a day of memory, thought. I'd like to ask every single one of you today to do one thing, one simple thing. And that alone, I believe, is enough to transform your Rosh Hashanah in an incredibly positive way. I want to get creative. Has someone ever spoken Lashon Hara about you? Yeah? You really mad? I'd like to for one second imagine the person and imagine how it's possible that the thing that he's done and the hurt that he's caused is not as bad as I thought. Can someone tell me how that could be possible? How could it be? Guy spoke Lashon Araba. How is it possible that it's not as bad as I thought? Someone speaking badly about you, you might think to yourself, you know what? Poor guy. You know? You know, he's speaking about me because he wants to be me. Poor guy, speaking about me because he has so little in his own life that the only way he gets kicks is by putting other people down. I'm not angry at him, I feel sorry for him. Yeah? Uh, you're, unfortunately, you're in a situation where you're, you're tempted to do the wrong thing. Let's think, how do I plug in my brain to be my greatest friend? You know how I do it? My brain, instead of imagining like Chava does, oh, what is this cheeseburger going to taste like? Oh, I smell it, it's delicious, that bun. You ever see, they, it's, it like plays with you. I always love this. You ever see a commercial, right, on the TV for like a hamburger at like McDonald's? I mean, that thing, it looks like supernatural. Like they take the thing, put it on it. On the burger. And then all of a sudden, in every commercial, they're cutting vegetables. The vegetables are flying in the air. You ever notice that? Right. Lettuce is like crunch. But then you go, then you go to McDonald's, you order the burger. They just hand you this thing that looks like it was ironed. Like, you know, it's just a flat thing. And you you're like, this is, where are the flying vegetables? 
You hold the burger up to your ear, you know, when you want to hear the tss. And all you hear is like crunch. The sound that horse meat makes when you squeeze it. <laughs> it's such a disappointment. The power of the Yetzehara is to get us to imagine how delicious sin is. You know what the underutilized power of the Yetzer HaTov is? Imagining the positive feelings that I'll get when I overcome. How good will I feel? Taste the feeling of successfully standing up to eating really, forget kosher food for a second, really unhealthy food. Think about how it feels to be and to feel like you're not a slave to chocolate ice cream. Some of you are laughing at the thought. You're like, Rabbi, you speak words of blasphemy in a synagogue. Okay? Do you understand me? You hear with me on this? The power of a tzaddik is to use his or her imagination to imagine all the positive outcomes of staying away from the right thing. If that's the case, then let everyone in this room for one second, and afterwards you could come forward and ask me uh, for, if, if, it, if it's not working for you, how to do it right, because I'd love to teach you. It's such a beautiful thing. Take your biggest challenge, whatever it might be, and I want you to imagine for one second the glorious feeling you'll have when you're finally free of it. I remember once I was uh, sitting at a, at a Shabbat meal and a man stood up and he was giving a Dvar Torah. And he said, you know, one of the things that I learned when... Uh, when I went to AA and he started speaking about recognizing that there's a higher power. He talked about how when he was nervous or anxious and he walked past the bar and he could feel, he could feel like physically, like he was being pulled in to get that crave, that alcoholic craving that he needed. And translate this addiction into whatever works for you, whatever your thing is, your kryptonite. He says he would feel physically like he'd be pulled in. And all he kept thinking about is being able to tell the sponsor, being able to tell his parents, being able to tell his friends. I walked past, the demon said hello, and I didn't answer. He could taste that. He could feel that. And the feeling about the way it would make him feel was a stronger voice eventually than the feeling, uh, than the call of the alcohol itself. And I'm sitting next to a young man, and the young man is crying. And I was like, okay, that was moving the way he said it, but you know. And the man says, he says, no, you don't understand. He says, what he described is the battle I lose every single day. I'm crying, he says, because I'm looking at somebody that's actually climbed out of the hell hole that I'm in. Where I spend money I don't have, time I don't have, nights I don't have. I threw away the best girlfriend in the world because she told me to shape up or ship out. And I couldn't say no to the bottle, so I said no to this girl. And I'm alone, and I have no money, and I have no job because I again let down my expectations at work. And what do I have from it? What do I have? And he's just sitting there crying on the side of this Shabbat meal where the man is speaking. It's devastating to see. Devastating to see it. But he's all of us. Yearning for change. All of us. He's all of us struggling to be able to find a motivator strong enough to help us see. Imagine yourself walking into a room where you need to say sorry to somebody and you can't because you're humiliated, you're embarrassed. Imagine the scene. 
Imagine walking in saying, I'm sorry. Then imagine what they're going to say back to you. Oh, you're sorry? Now you're coming? Six months? It takes you to say you're sorry? Imagine your response. What's your response? Yeah, I couldn't build up the courage until now. I'm really sorry. And you know, well, what happened now? What happened now? Someone in my family is sick. I heard the rabbi said a class that if you do something, if you do an act to bring shalom, it brings beracha. I'm doing this for my mom. Imagine what the guy's face looks like. Please forgive me. Imagine yourself. Imagine him saying, you know what? I wouldn't forgive you, but your mom is sick. I don't, you know, everybody loves your moms. I forgive you. Imagine it. And then you're standing outside and you feel like you can't do it. You already have the script in front of you. That's the power of the mind. One of the greatest lines ever. I believe they attributed it to, uh, actually to Henry Ford, not such a great uh, friend of the Jewish people. I heard Rav Noach Weinberg sharing it once. And it really struck me. It said, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. So if you could think yourself into a can, what do you want to be thinking about this Rosh Hashanah? Now I want you to look at the table that we're feasting on on Rosh Hashanah. We pick up one thing and we say, she is stalku o yevenu. All the things that we struggle with, our demons, our problems, Hashem, take them away. Hearing that, tasting that, actually making it into a concrete thing, it drives something into the brain in a way that simple words can't do. We're preparing our head to be a different head. Now, if God forbid you fell on your head, you forgot your name, you forgot where you lived, you forgot everything that you know up until this point, what job would you go out and do? What kind of person would you date? Which synagogue would you join? Which community? Which area or place would you live in if no place felt like home? If you had no ties to New York City and you woke up one day and had no memories, where would you move to? This is the power of a Rosh Hashanah. It starts again and it builds like God once did using the power of Allah b'machshava to create new realities. So in the truest sense, we've been introduced tonight to the power of them apples. We've been introduced tonight to the dichotomy of both Rasha and Sadiq looking at the same thing and one of them seeing a giant mountain. How could I ever do that? I can't do that. I have to steal? What do you mean steal? Yeah, it's just taking some money. Yeah, but who's the, think, who's the money coming from? Imagine a poor woman sitting in the freezing cold with her kids and the mom says to the kids, we can't afford to turn on the heat because Shlomo stole our money. That's how you stop yourself. You use your brain. You imagine that stealing this is not a nameless, faceless crime. I'm stealing from someone. They have a name. They have a need. And I stole it from them. You hear that now? Different ball game. I'd like to end with a small beracha. A beracha that I think maybe encompasses everything in the world. You know, on the mezuzah that we kiss every day when we walk in, there's three letters that are exposed on the front of the mezuzah. Does anyone know what they are? Shin, Dalid, and Yud. It's one of the names of God. But God has many names. Why is it that we choose that name to put on the front of the mezuzah? How come? Our rabbis tell us that the name Shin, Dalid, Yud, Shakai, 
I'm pronouncing it differently because you're not supposed to just say God's name without context. Stands for She'amar Le'olamo Dai. He said to his world, enough. He created a boundary for the ocean so that there would be dry land. He created a boundary for the land so that there would be oceans, which would allow for the, uh, uh, the condensation to rise into the clouds after the sun beat on the oceans so that it could rain and provide life-giving uh, uh, rains in all the areas where we needed to have produce. God said, die to the heavens. He said, die to the distance between the sun and the earth because if we were closer, we would be burned. If we were further, we would freeze. God created boundaries. She'amale olamo, die, enough. When we walk out of our home, we put our hand on the mezuzah and we say, She'amale olamo, die. We walk into our homes and we say, and we kiss, She'amale olamo, die. There are boundaries that exist outside of the Jewish home and inside the Jewish home. Outside the Jewish home, you are told that your socioeconomic background defines who you are. Outside of the Jewish home, you are told that your money will allow you to define yourself as a success. How you finish is everything, and the effort means nothing. And in the Jewish home, we have a very different set of boundaries. We have a very different set of values. So when we walk out, we take with love the boundaries of our home, what makes a Jew inside, what values a person inside those four walls, and we attempt to walk out into the world maintaining those boundaries, those walls with us. But when we come out, and we walk back into the house, we also need to leave that out from within. I was sitting with a couple that got married this week, and I said, you know, getting married is like going on vacation. And they were like, oh, really? And they thought it meant like, oh, they're going to be on a vacation, it's a honeymoon. I'm like, I'm not saying that. I said, before you go on vacation, you have a suitcase. And in that suitcase, you pack stuff that you need for your vacation. But as everyone will know, you put some things in, and you put some things back. You don't take 94 bathing suits on a two-day vacation. You take two. Let's be honest, four. Right? You don't take all your shoes. You can't. You take some. You have a decision to make when you're getting married, I said. Which parts of yourself you don't want to pack. And which parts of yourself you want to bring into the marriage. Rosh Hashanah is the same. I'm not telling you, oh, I have to change, I have to uproot this, I got to be this, I got to be something else. I'm telling you, choose what you want to pack. And then in your new world, you didn't bring any of that. You don't have it. So what do you do? You make do with the things that you brought. What are you leaving behind? What are you not packing? What are you not bringing into this new year? Which feelings of guilt, of anger, which averot, which thoughts, which people, which friendships? This new head, it's everything. But it needs to be given the importance that it is due and, it's, and it needs to be given the time to be able to fill and pack exactly what you want to bring with you into the new year. Thank you so much for listening. Shana Tova.